Good morning, good morning. If you got a Bible, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 4. We'll be in verse 31 in just a moment. And uh, wow, the, uh, the HVAC system's working well. <laughs> well, I don't know how many of you have ever heard the statement, the good is the enemy of the best. Have you heard that before? The good is the enemy of the best. It kind of makes sense, right? If good is good enough, you might never get to the best, right? Uh, Some folks are like, well, I'm just going to do good, and as long as it's good enough, but they never get to the best. Jim Collins, in his famous business book, From Good to Great, popularized the idea. He phrased it just a little bit differently. He said, the good is the enemy of the great. If we have our contentment set here, there are heights we may never reach. But he actually flipped on its head an older proverb that says this, the perfect is the enemy of the good. What could that possibly mean? Well, some people think it means that if you are a perfectionist, you may never actually achieve anything. If in your mind, the only acceptable solution is perfection, you might turn your back to good solutions. You may have met some people who are kind of like all or nothing people. They make no progress because they can't make all the progress. So here's the question. If the good is the enemy of the best and the perfect is the enemy of the good, how in the world are we supposed to run our lives? Are we supposed to aim at the good or are we supposed to aim at the best? Because they seem to be enemies of each other. And if we use these as guidelines or guardrails to our lives, where are we going to end up? Well, I want to kind of cut through the thicket this morning and actually with uh, a series of messages that we're right in the middle of and identify just some priorities. When it comes to following Jesus, we don't necessarily have all the answers right in front of us. But if we look at the life of Jesus, we can see that he lived by a certain set of priorities. And if we can adopt Jesus' priorities for our own lives, we're going to find some very clear guidelines. Now, we started this last Sunday in Luke chapter 4, all the way back in verse 16, where we saw that one of Jesus' priorities was our spiritual condition. And that was the focus of last Sunday's message. Today, it's going to be just a little bit different. I actually have two big ideas from the text we're going to look at. Hopefully, you'll take both of them with you. But these are priorities that I'm hoping that we can adopt as we follow Jesus on the Jesus way. So if you have Luke chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading in verse 31. And uh, along the way, I'm going to stop a couple of times to maybe point a couple of things out. But let's go ahead and start in verse 31. The Bible says that Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astonished at his teaching because, and we're going to pause here, because his message had, you tell me, his message had what, church? His message had authority. Now, I want you to hang on to that idea that Jesus' message had authority. That's what amazed the people as he spoke. And you say, what, what did that really look like? Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that their amazement came because Jesus taught with authority, not like the scribes. You see, there were plenty of teachers in Jesus' day. And they would open the scriptures and they would teach. But none of them ever taught based upon their own interpretation or their own innovation. What they would do is they would research the scholars, the commentators, centuries of Bible studies. And if you were to listen to one of them teach, they would simply be quoting scholar after scholar, rabbi after rabbi, basing their message on somebody else's authority. When Jesus opened the scriptures, he didn't do that. Jesus opened the scriptures and he taught with his own 
authority. We saw that last Sunday when he opened up the book of Isaiah, read a prophecy and said, I tell you that today this prophecy is being fulfilled while you're listening. No scribe could have ever said that. No scholar could have ever said that. You can't research that. Jesus had to say it. And that's what amazed them was they were speaking or he was speaking on his own authority. Now, before we go on into the story any deeper, I really want to stress that none of us can do that. I'm not preaching to you today on my authority. I don't have the ability to do that. All I come to you with is the authority of the word of God. Whenever I teach or preach, I make it my goal to try to show you how what I am saying is based upon the scriptures. And I trust that you can see that. If at any time you can't see that, you have the obligation to come to me and say, Aaron, I don't see how what you said comes out of the scriptures. And then we can discuss it and we get down there. I'm not an infallible interpreter of scripture. I don't preach on my own authority. By the way, beware preachers who do. Beware preachers to who do. I was listening to several popular preachers this week to just try to sample some of the stuff that's out there. And there are a number of preachers who will preach on their own authority. That is, they say, God said to me to tell you, hold up, <laughs> hold up. Are we going to take your word for that? Or I am speaking a prophetic word over you. Now, now, church, I, I think God does speak through people. I think God does deliver words through people, but always to be tested by the church against the supreme authority, which is Scripture. Jesus, however, is the author of Scripture. He is the enfleshed, embodied Word of God. He's allowed to do this, and that's what amazed them is that he's teaching on his own authority. So let's keep reading. His message had authority. Verse 33, in the synagogue... There was a man with an unclean demonic spirit who cried out with a loud voice, leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, be silent and come out of him. And throwing him down before them, the demon came out of him without hurting him at all. Now let's pause there for just a second. What response do you suppose the audience had? I mean, come on, none of us, I don't think any of us, maybe you have, but I have never, never have I ever been in a church service and have a demon-possessed man walk in and start screaming. I have talked to people who've experienced that. I never have, okay? Demon-possessed man comes into church and starts doing whatever demon-possessed people do and Jesus silences this guy, or, or rebukes the demon, tells him to come out, and the demon's talking to Jesus, and Jesus rebukes him, and then the, 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 the demon throws the man down on the ground, and then he gets up and he's fine. What in the world response do you suppose you would have had to that? <laughs> well, their response was actually somewhat positive. You would have thought, well, they would look and say, look what Jesus can do. Wow, he must be awesome. He must be something special. That is not, in fact, their, their response. I want you to see the very next verse. Look at this. This is fantastic. Verse 36. Amazement came over them all. No kidding. And they were saying to one another, here it is, what is this message? For he commands the unclean spirits with, what's the word again, church? authority and power, and they come out. We're going to pause there for, there for just a second. Do you, do, you, do you notice what just happened? As he was teaching, we read this just a little bit earlier, they were astonished because his message had authority. Then he casts a demon out of a man, and their response is, what is this message? because he commands the demons with authority. It wasn't the miracle that got their attention, or rather the miracle got their attention, but the miracle pointed their attention to the message. Okay, this is a cool message he's preaching. He's preaching on his own authority. That's amazing. Oh, on his own authority, he commands demons to come out. I think maybe we should listen to what he was saying. What a great transition. This was just great. I mean, they're like, okay, instead of just following him, they're like, okay, you're, you've got authority. I want to listen to your message. 
That's powerful. So we keep going. Verse 37. Uh, and news about him began to go out into every place in the vicinity. Makes sense, right? Got a lot of attention. After he left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now, who's Simon? You know him better as Peter, okay? Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Does that sound odd to you? That sounds odd to me. We don't rebuke diseases. Diseases aren't things, entities to be rebuked. Diseases don't leave. You're like, well, Aaron, this was just old-fashioned times. They didn't know the difference between the, the body and the soul. Well, Luke actually was a doctor, the guy writing this. Like, if anybody knew, he knew. I just, we're going to hang on to that for just a second because I think it's really interesting the way that he phrases that. Jesus rebuked the fever and it left her. Well, the result was she got up immediately and began to serve them. When the sun was setting, uh, because the Sabbath day was over, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. As he laid his hands on each one of them, he healed them. Also, demons were coming out of many, shouting and saying, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because he knew, or because they knew he was the Christ. You know, he's silencing the demons because it's not time for that kind of news to become public. The demons are basically attempting to hijack his mission. That's why he's rebuking them. It's not that he's not the son of God. It's just, this isn't my message at this point in time. That's, that's what's going on there. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Verse 42. When it was day, he went out and made his way to a deserted place. But the crowds were searching for him. They came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. And why do you suppose that was? Well, because he's shown up. He's performed miracles, cast out demons. He's healed people. He's got a message that really they want to pay attention to. We don't want this guy to go away. Uh, we want more of this. This is, this is great, right? I mean, last week, when Jesus preached, they tried to kill him. This week, Jesus preaches, and they want him to stay. They want more. This is what we want, right? So how does Jesus respond? Verse 43, but he said to them, it is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. <laughs> I think it's amazing. He finally has a friendly audience that can't get enough of his ministry. And he says, time to go. <laughs> I've got to preach the gospel to other towns just like I did here, because that's why I was sent. And he did. He left that town. He came back every now and then, but he left and he went to other towns. So what from this story would you say is Jesus's priority? Because I think it's pretty clear what his priority is on, on this, this particular topic. And here's how I've chosen to phrase it. We're going to put it on the screen. Evangelism is more important than exorcism. He has an opportunity to be casting out demons. He's like, no, I got to preach the gospel. Jesus established a clear set priority. Preaching the gospel is more important than sticking around this town and doing miracles. Now, let's go ahead and define our terms. I, I kind of just did that, but let's go ahead and define our terms real quick. Evangelism. It's a word you hear in church quite a bit. What does the word actually mean? Evangelism is simply this proclaiming the gospel. Now, problem is, I just used another church word. Gospel. What's gospel? It means good news. Yes, true it does. But I need to make sure we understand what this good news is. Here's why. Because many of us get confused and we think that the gospel is just any kind of news that makes us feel good. Specifically, the gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. 
The good news actually starts with bad news, believe it or not. The bad news is that although God created us in his image, we have sinned against God. We have ruined what he created. We have missed out on what he designed us for. And we have brought upon ourselves the judgment of a holy God. We deserve the judgment that we get. That's, that's all the bad news. But the good news comes in and says, because God loves us, he doesn't want, us, want to see us experience the destruction we've created for ourselves. And instead, he has sent his son, Jesus, to live a perfect life that he can then give in exchange for hours, going to the cross in our place, taking our sin upon himself, giving his righteousness to us, rising again from the dead so that we can have eternal life as a free gift to be received through repentance and faith in him. That's the good news. And it means that he will begin transforming us from the inside out so that we become the kind of people who can fully enjoy all that he created us for, namely himself. Now, I specify that because we live in a day where the gospel gets misconstrued. It's good news. But that doesn't mean that any news that makes us feel good is the same that what Jesus is talking about. And I say that because of a verse like 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I think it's verse 3, where the apostle wrote, he said, in the last days, which are now, people will grow tired of sound teaching. They will not endure sound teaching, but instead, after their own lusts, with itching ears, they will accumulate to themselves teachers who will teach them what they want to hear. Now, the best thing you could possibly hear is the gospel of Jesus. But there are a lot of messages out there that make you feel good temporarily. I spoke a few weeks ago about what we call the so-called prosperity gospel. And if you hear a prosperity preacher, I promise you, you will probably feel pretty good for a little bit. That's what they specialize in, is making people feel good. But the message they deliver makes Jesus completely unnecessary, and the good feelings don't last. Now, you might sit there and say, Aaron, do you just want people to be miserable? No, 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 no. That's not my goal. I don't want you to feel miserable. Here's what I want for you. I want your lives to be filled with love. I want your lives to be filled with joy beyond words. I want your lives to be filled with supernatural peace beyond any human understanding. That's what I want for you. It only comes through Jesus though. But the, the prosperity messages or the, the, the messages that we often cling to, they don't give us supernatural Christ-like love. They, they fill our hearts with social politeness. They don't fill our hearts with inexpressible joy. They fill our hearts with temporary happiness. And they don't fill our hearts with supernatural peace. They just give a momentary calm. Now, if you're suffering, I... I think any calm and any peace is, is good, and I wish that for you, but more than anything, I want you and me and my neighbors to have that love, that joy, that peace that only comes through Jesus, and the good news is that through Jesus, your life can be filled with these things. That's evangelism. What's exorcism? Simple. Driving the devil out. That's exorcism. I know a lot of times we think of exorcism in terms of a movie with a, with a priest in a black cloak and, you know, people tied to a bed and sprinkling holy water and, you know, waving crucifixes and things like that. But quite simply, exorcism is just driving the devil out. And in this case, the story we just read about Jesus, it was quite the spectacle. And that's what Jesus is avoiding, People want the spectacle. They want the show. And Jesus is trying to say the message is more important than the show. I don't want to do all this stuff that draws attention to me as if I'm building a brand. I'm not doing this to impress you. I'm doing this to direct your attention to the message. They wanted more miracles. And this is why evangelism is more important than exorcism. I'm just using exorcism as one example of the kinds of things that get people's attention. 
You say, but, but Aaron, shouldn't we be doing things that get people's attention? Well, yes and no, but Jesus shows us that more important than getting people's attention, more important than drawing a crowd is preaching the good news of Jesus. That's the priority. Evangelism is more important than exorcism. Now, I'm not going to say that all spectacles and shows are of the devil, but I, I hope we understand this morning the devil is real. The devil is real. Uh, we, we don't really reckon with this. We read this story about how Jesus cast out a demon, and most of us have no personal experience to connect to this. We're like, demons? Really? I've never really encountered one of those. So that, that was just an old-fashioned thing. They, that what he was encountering was a mental illness that they thought was demonic. No, demons are real. Why have I never seen one? Um, because the devil does his best work when you don't think he's there. It's really that simple. It was the French philosopher that said the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince people he didn't exist. Come on, I can do anything if you don't know I'm there. That's what the devil has done. Or he's done something even more sinister. You see, if I ask you to describe the devil for me, most of us are going to, you know, the first thing that probably pops into our mind is some big, horned, red, scary, toothy, slimy beast that does all sorts of evil, destructive things. But that's not what the devil does. The devil comes to you dressed as the thing you want most. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that he appears as an angel of light. The devil does his best to appear like Jesus to get your attention off of Jesus. And some of the most satanic things happening in America today are happening in churches. I don't believe the pastors are worshiping Satan. That's not what I meant by that. I just mean that by getting our attention off the gospel of Jesus, Satan is winning because that's his goal. If he can keep us occupied with all sorts of religious activity, if he can keep us occupied with all sorts of good things that aren't the best thing, he can keep us away from Jesus. And that is his goal. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age, that would be the devil in this case, in this case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is the devil's goal to keep you from seeing the gospel. And if he can do it by offering you something that seems like the gospel but is not quite the gospel, that uncanny valley appearing between the real gospel and the false gospel, that's what he'll do. He doesn't just do it in churches, though. I mean, he's plenty happy to do anything he can to get your eyes off of Jesus. That's his play. He's like, well, I've never really encountered him. Yeah, you have. Yes, you absolutely have. If your life has gone through a period of time where you haven't drawn your strength and your joy and your peace and your love from Jesus, guess who's at work in that? That's the devil, folks. Like, I didn't feel him. I didn't see him. Right, because if, he, if you feel him and see him, game's up. He doesn't want to be seen or felt. He wants your eyes off of Jesus, and he wants you to think it's normal. In fact, he wants you to think it's pleasurable. And that leads us to the second big idea from this text. The first idea, Jesus' priorities, evangelism is more important than exorcism. But guess what, church? Evangelism is exorcism. Evangelism is exorcism. You know what I think is amazing? Jesus preached. They're like, his message has authority. He cast out a demon. And they're like, oh, wait, what was that message again? Because look at the authority. At the beginning of Luke chapter four, the devil actually took Jesus to the top of a mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, if you worship me, I will give you all the authority. Obviously, Jesus said no. And bit by bit, place by place, sermon by sermon, Jesus exerted his own authority and defeated the devil time and time again. I told you earlier, I cannot preach on my own authority and neither can you. 
But every one of us in this room can preach with the authority of Jesus when we proclaim the gospel. And the gospel drives out the devil. I don't mean this in a formulaic way. Like all I got to do is quote this formula and the devil's going to run away. Although the Bible does say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do we resist him? With the good news of Jesus. With the good news of Jesus. You see, the devil's everywhere in our culture. We call it materialism. The Bible calls it covetousness. The idea that I can't be content without some material good. I can't be happy, joyful, peaceful without this thing. Folks, that's the devil. That's the devil. He's coming between you and Jesus on the back of a thing. <laughs> the gospel will drive him out because with the gospel in Jesus, I have everything God wants for me. Do you ever envy someone? Are you ever jealous that somebody has something you don't have? That's the devil because it's gotten your eyes off of Jesus. The gospel creates contentment. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What was he talking about? Flying? Building a business? No, he was talking about being content. That's the devil. Are you having relationship drama? That's the devil. If you're married, how many times have you spent arguing about whose fault something was? Or who's right? That's the devil. You're like, Aaron, you're just calling everything the devil. Yeah, because he's present in places we don't suspect. You would be shocked to go through your New Testament and see how many different things are actually attributed to the devil. The Bible actually literally says in James chapter three that wherever there is envy and discontent and strife, guess what? That's coming from demons and the devil. You're like, aren't we bad enough without the devil? Well, sure. I mean, we can mess stuff up without the devil all we want, but he's going to make sure we do. So while you are arguing with your spouse over whose fault it is, the gospel says that this should be a relationship of unity where each person is submitting to one another and treating the other person as more important than themselves. The gospel of Jesus shows us different kinds of relationships. And if you're experiencing drama or fighting or parents, how about this? Parents, do you guys, do we understand that our kids are going to do a lot of dumb stuff? We did a lot of dumb stuff, right? So it's not surprising. But our kids are going to do things <laughs> that are really dumb and it's going to create a lot of stress in our lives and if we're not careful it's going to get our eyes off of Jesus it's going to get our eyes off of our heavenly father it's going to get our eyes off of the fact that what our children need is not to be beat over the head and guilted and what they need to be done is being treated like our heavenly father treats us not caving on right or wrong but giving of grace and mercy. What about addictions and emotional mood disorders? Recently, a very popular preacher made a lot of waves through an, I believe, unwise statement claiming that mental health disorders aren't real. Mental health disorders are real. But the mistake of our age is to treat many disorders, not necessarily all, but to treat many disorders as only a disorder of the body, neglecting the fact that we are both body and soul. And what happens to us physically has a spiritual component. What happens to us spiritually has a physical component. And believe me when I say that the devil is more than happy to screw with your body and screw with your mind. And so to say that a, an emotional mood disorder, an addiction, depression, to say that these have nothing to do with the devil is hopelessly naive. To say that it has nothing to do with the body is just as hopelessly naive. But I fear that we spend so much time focusing on the body alone that we neglect the power of the gospel to renew our thinking and our hearts. 
And if the devil can get us to focus on our body alone, guess where our eyes aren't? On Jesus and the power of the gospel. We could talk about the appetite dulling effects of social media, the way that our brains get rewired through Instagram and TikTok so that we actually have no attention span or appetite for the Bible or for prayer. We could talk about the way that the devil keeps us off of our knees, trusting in what I can do rather than resting in God. We can talk about the hash the devil makes of our lives when we have broken hearts and broken dreams, when we realize that Jesus can heal our heart and Jesus' plan for our life is better than anything that we could possibly devise on our own. If you've suffered from lies and betrayal and a lack of trust, realize that many people are acting out of fear, greed, guilt, and trauma, and the gospel has an answer for all of it, but the devil will use all of it to get our eyes off of Jesus, which is why I say evangelism is exorcism. The devil does not have authority in your life. Jesus does. And on the basis of Jesus's authority, I declare to you that Jesus died for those who repent of their sin and trust in him. And he gives eternal life, fellowship with God, the father that manifests itself through love for God, love for neighbor, joy in the Holy Spirit and peace that passes all under understanding. This is the gift of God, and it is yours in Jesus, and the devil will do anything to get you away from it. So I preach the gospel to you to drive the devil out, and I challenge you to preach the gospel to yourselves to drive the devil out. Preach the gospel to your spouse. Preach the gospel to your children. Preach the gospel to your neighbors, and let's drive the devil out. What's the priority? Evangelism. Preaching the gospel is the priority. And so let's find a way to get to the gospel. In our relationships, our conversations, our place in our community, let's find a way to get to the gospel. Later today, you'll receive an email from me detailing some of our plans for this summer to get the gospel to our neighbors and our neighborhood. I want to share with you some of these ways. Some of the things are basically building the bridge to get the gospel there. Some of these things are preaching the gospel. Watch for ways that you can be involved. But for today, for this moment right here, preach the gospel to yourself. And remember what God has given you in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your grace to us. Thank you for the gift of your son. How I pray, Lord, that those who do not know you will repent and believe in you so that they too can know the eternal life that is our gift in Jesus. Lord, let us prioritize evangelism in our lives, in our homes, in our friendships. And Lord, I pray for my neighborhood. I pray for my community. Pray for my subdivision, Lord, that they too will experience the expulsive power of the gospel. It is in Jesus' name I pray, amen.